principal investigator. In 65, he was selected as a space shuttle mission specialist pilot. In, in 1995, in 96, he was a candidate space shuttle payload specialist. In 2010, he became a suborbital payload specialist trainee and is expected to fly several space missions this next year. In 2010, Dr. Dr. Stern was elected to be the president and CEO of the Golden Spike Company, a commercial space exploration corporation and the new lunar exploration expedition. Additionally, since 2009, he's been an associate vice president at the Southwest Research Institute. And since 2008, has had his own aerospace consulting practice. So that's enough. Thank you. And uh, welcome, welcome to Jack. Thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation. Is that too loud? No, no, no. All, right. All right. Well, again, thanks for the invitation. It's great to come here and speak about one of my favorite subjects. Uh, and it's great to be back in Dallas. I grew up around here. Uh, with high school in what used to be called North Dallas, but down on Preston Road, around Royal Lane, a school called St. Mark's. Uh, my dad came down here a little bit earlier, uh, admitting that he had never been to one of these meetings before, but I just wanted to point out my mom is in the audience, and my brother is here, so I better do this right. <laughs> <laughs> but I am looking forward to talking to you about New Horizons. If we can dim the lights partially, I think you'll have a better experience with the slide. Great, okay. Uh, let's let's start at the beginning. If this works. There we go, at the beginning. I always wanted to be in science. Um, I remember as a little kid that my favorite presents were always presents like this, getting a microscope when I was five or six years old. And uh, I, I always grew up with just one thing in mind, and that was to be in space exploration and astronomy. And it worked out. I have had so much fun in this career. It has been a great ride uh, from the time that I started college, and I really got to do it uh, every day of my life once I got out of college and got out of graduate school. As, as you heard earlier, um, I've had these experiences that you don't normally get that have just made it so much fun. I flew F-18s for five years, I flew U-2s. Um, more recently, I've been training in F-104s and zero-G aircraft for space flight. Um, I love to teach, I love to have the opportunity to do those things and do public speaking like I'm doing tonight. Uh, but one of my favorite aspects uh, of what I've been doing is directing space missions. As you heard, I've done quite a number of them from uh, very large, 50-foot tall, uh, sounding rockets that fly suborbitally, uh, testing telescopes and technologies to orbital missions, shuttle missions, and missions to the planet. And of all of those missions that I've worked on, New Horizons is my absolute favorite. It's my baby. I've worked on it since 1989. Uh, this is what it's all about. This is our uh, route of flight. We took off from the Earth, as you heard, in January of 2006 on an almost 10 year long journey all the way across the solar system to the very frontier of our knowledge. We took off as the fastest spacecraft ever launched. Think about this. When I was a boy, Apollo missions used to take off for the moon and travel 25,000 miles an hour and reach the orbit of the moon in three days flat. Well, this little spacecraft passed the orbit of the moon in nine hours. That's about 0.3 days. Uh, we reached Jupiter 13 months later. The previous spacecraft uh, to reach Jupiter took four and a half years. The one before that took six years. This is really a very, very fast machine with a very long way to go. All the way out there, as you can tell, I don't think I have a pointer, but you can see where our red trajectory line intersects the orbit of Pluto as it crosses the plane of the solar system in 2015. Uh, currently, we are uh, uh, just past halfway between the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. And you can see from that overhead view on your left, looking down on the or orbits of the planets, we are presently about two and a half billion miles from the Earth. Uh, it's been, well, that's 
that's a little bit round off. It's been 2,588 days today since launch for Moose County. <laughs> we are about 80% of the way through this decade long journey, and everything aboard the spacecraft is healthy. We have a great fuel supply, and everything's working, and we are tickle tape. And one of the main messages I want you to get, particularly for the younger people in this audience, is that there's only one nation on Earth that can do this stuff. And it's the nation you live in, it's the United States of America. No other country has been able to mount the technology to explore the outer solar system. This is not for kids. I mean, this technology is not, the, not what your average spacefaring nation can do. This is really the big leagues, and we have led for 30 years. When you talk about, sometimes you hear that term, soft power projection. Um, this is a fantastic example of soft power projection for the United States. Every kid everywhere in the world that reads about uh, the solar system in their science classes hears names like Voyager, Pioneer, and soon New Horizons. And you don't need to say any more. They know that's America. And they know that brand, NASA. And there's only one country on Earth that can do it. It's us. OK. So exactly how did we get to do this? How did we get to mount a $720 mission? Oh, that's $720 million. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was at NASA headquarters, I was famous for cost cutting, but I wasn't that good. <laughs> yeah. So how do, we, how do you raise a billion dollars, essentially? How do you do that? Back in 1989, about the time of the last planetary, the, new, the, the last time we sent a spacecraft to a new planet, Voyager arrived in 1989 at Neptune. And just on the heels of that encounter, I walked into NASA headquarters, still in graduate school, and went to the guy that was running the, the planetary program at, for NASA, the planetary exploration program, and I said, Dr. Briggs, there's, there's some of us that think that there's some great science in going to Pluto. Why don't we have a mission on the books to Pluto? Uh, and he said, well, nobody's ever asked me that before. And uh, that's how this all began. Well, about a year later, the post office issued a set of stamps commemorating the exploration of planets with a spacecraft on each stamp that had been the first spacecraft of that target. So Mariner 4 to Mars, Mariner 2 to Venus, Mariner 10 to Mercury, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the only thing they could think of for Pluto was this silly thing. <laughs> now, that is not how you, you raise a billion dollars, by telling people, you know, look, we haven't done that yet, so we really ought to do that. Because there are a lot of things we haven't done. And when you're limited in your budget, when you, when you live on a fixed income like NASA does, uh, then you have to really have a little better prioritization than we just haven't been there before. So let's give it a whirl. Um, and so then you get more creative. You think of other ways to do it. This is not... <laughs> <laughs> There's some good parts there. You know, commercial space flight is coming. They come to this. But this is not how you did it in the 90s, that's for sure. What you had to do was enter this region known as the Washington Beltway, and learn your way around and learn how to raise the money in a town where there are 535 cooks in the kitchen. And you can go to any fine restaurant in any town, I'm sure you're in Dallas, if you go talk to the, to the owners of fine restaurants and ask them the question, what's the optimal number of cooks in the kitchen, they will never respond with 535. <laughs> it is complicated to get that consensus. It took us 14 years. It took a lot of this. We got knocked down, we got thrown out of the room, we got canceled five different times. And we stuck with it. And here's what happened. The astronomy is what triumphed. Um, this plot's a little bit, um, uh, a little bit um, technical, so let me explain. Some of you will recognize it's a, it's a log log plot, but what it's basically plotting in the upper right Along the horizontal axis is the distance of things from the sun. And along the vertical axis, their mass. And the distances are plotted in units of the Earth's distance from the sun. So you can see the one um, down there on the, uh, the bottom. Uh, and that's where the Earth lies. And the 10, that's all the way out at Saturn, 10 times as far away. And then 100 times as far away at 
the time this plot was made, we didn't know of anything there. And then the units of mass are also pretty units of Earth's mass. So you see that clump of four objects, Venus, Earth, Mercury, and Mars, that's the four terrestrial planets. They're roughly the same mass and roughly in the same location in close to the sun. That's why they're a clump. And then there's another clump of high mass planets, so-called giant planets, the freakishly large ones, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, that are about 10 times, 20 times as far away from the sun as the terrestrial planets. And then in that little square in the right is Pluto, discovered in 1930 with a mass that's only about two one thousandths of the mass of the Earth and very far out and all by itself and people had looked for a long time, for decades and there was this who ordered that thing out there very far from the sun and that was our view of the solar system four terrestrial planets, four more giant planets and one misfit named Pluto and most of the people in this room I suspect when you first learn something about the solar system of planets that's how you learned it well, there was a revolution in my field in the 1990s. We discovered that Pluto's not alone. In fact, the solar system is littered with these things. Just like Pluto, similar size, but a wide variety of characteristics, atmospheres, no atmospheres, gray color, red color, some moons, no moons, big moons, little moons. But in the lower left here is a view looking down as if you were way above the solar system. And that ring of red dots are Pluto-like objects all over the outer solar system. They were too faint to see with the technology of the mid-20th century, but by the 1990s, it was possible to detect them. It's not because we got bigger telescopes. It's because we got better detectors and because we got computers to look at the data, which was you know, needle in a haystack type uh, searches. And first there was one in 1992, and then there were four in 1993, and then there were 10 by 1994, and today there were a thousand of them in the bag. Turns out the solar system is really good at making small planets. In fact, who's the misfit now? <laughs> right? This is the most dominant class of planet, not only in our solar system, but we think in the galaxy. And that is what turned the tide. I'll say a little bit more about that. But first, I want to just make sure we understand the scale of these things, because they are, they are small compared to the Earth, but they are not small. This is an artist's conception of Pluto, the big reddish thing with the white polar gas. And in the little square green box up there are all the asteroids that we've ever flown by. This is an enormous object. If you were to drive around the, cir the circumference, around the equator, of Pluto. It's as far as from Manhattan to Moscow. Okay? So it's not nearly as far as around the entire Earth, but this is by no means a diminutive object. And by the way, uh, you know, we call them, in fact, we call them dwarf planets uh, in analogy to dwarf stars. And for those that don't know in the audience, our star, the Sun, is a dwarf star. These are the sizes of some common stars that you can see with a telescope um, if you went out to one of those star farms. And our sun is that little pit squeak right up there. Okay? It's also the most common type of star in the galaxy. And so there's an analogy there with these dwarf planets. In astronomy, we have dwarf galaxies, dwarf stars, dwarf planets. It's not an insult. It's not a pejorative term. It's a technical term, as a matter of fact. And what convinced Washington to spend the money on this exploration, what, road, what caused this to rise to the top of the queue, is the fact that suddenly we realized that all of our exploration of the planets had left out the most populous class of planet in the solar system. We spent 40 years studying four terrestrials and four giant planets, and then we discovered there's a whole other class we had no idea about. Pluto had just been the tip of the iceberg, the brightest one, detected in 1930 by a 24-year-old kid named Clyde Tombaugh, straight off the farm from Kansas. And it took until the 1990s till we could find the second, and then there was just an explosion of them. And the National Academy of Sciences then ranked this mission, not New Horizons yet, just a mission to Pluto and explore the Kuiper Belt, at the very top of the queue for funding. 
And as a result, we got the opportunity to write a proposal for something that actually had a bank account. And that list of people in alphabetical order on the left is my team, my science team, that wrote that proposal, about as big as a New York City phone book, with everything from technical design data, the cost and schedules, and everything else you can imagine. That's the cover of the proposal there in the middle. This was in 2001. There were five large consortium teams that formed. Uh, we were up against the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is really the, the Goliath of planetary exploration. I teamed with the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, sort of the David and Goliath struggle. And we were, we were astounded to find out one day uh, that we were one of the two finalists out of those five proposals. And then, after a six-month funded study by NASA, uh, we were selected on the 29th of November. And David had beat Goliath. And we were given the opportunity to build this mission. And I'll tell you, after five cancellations of previous Pluto missions, all of which ran over budget, I pulled my team together, about as many people are here tonight, just the core team, <coughs> but became a team of 2,500 people a nearly billion dollar project, and I said, we are not gonna lose this. We are not gonna overrun. And there's one more thing. We need to get there via Jupiter, because we can save three and a half years and turn a 13 and a half year flight time into a nine and a half year flight time. So here it was November of 2001, and I said, we need to launch in a certain three week period in January of 2006. And uh, for a space flight project, particularly inventing a new kind of spacecraft like this, that was a pretty big challenge to do. Four years flat, you get launch approval for nuclear material on an unmanned rocket. A lot of people didn't think we could do it. This team of people did it. Very de dedicated team of engineers and scientists who basically devoted uh, four and a half years of their life to doing nothing but. I can tell you in my own case, it's just one example. After we launched, I asked my secretary, Jeanette, how many trips I took on the New Horizons contract in those four years. Four years and two months. And she came back and she said, 232. You can imagine, I was on the road the entire time, going to the different contractors, spending time with the folks building the spacecraft, getting my own instruments built. Um, and I live in Denver, I live near Denver, and we, we have to fly in the United Airlines because they're the big gorilla hub there. So think about that, 232 flights, 462 legs, eating needles on United. <laughs> I like to say, if that's not service to your country, what is? <laughs> this was a long time ago, we started this. My kids were little. Um, that's my son, Jordan. And uh, when we won it, uh, New Horizons in 2001, that little guy said, you know, I want to grow up and be a scientist. In fact, I call that the mad scientist picture. <laughs> and, and, I, and he said, and someday I want to work on New Horizons. No. He says, you know what, I figured it out. I'll just be finishing college here. So it was a long time ago. Let me tell you what we, we had to do. What NASA gave us basically a little more detailed version of this to-do list with three different clusters of objectives to fit within our budget and time frame. And the main objectives, the so-called required objectives, are called group one, and they're very simple, they're very easy to understand. When you get there, you've got to map the planet, you've got to map the surface composition, you get a spectrum at every point, and understand the structure of the atmosphere and its composition. Three-legged stool, got to do all three legs or the stool tips over. Then they gave us group two objectives that were listed as important. And when we wrote the proposal, the more group two objectives you could accomplish, the more points you'd get, as long as it didn't look like you were busting the bank on cost. So those have things like get high uh, resolution imagery on top of the spec imagery. Uh, map it thermally, so you have the temperatures in every location, like you would see in a weather map. Um, look for minor constituents in the atmosphere. Make elevation maps. And you can read the rest, I'm not gonna go through the whole list. And then there were some things at the bottom of the list that were sort of nice if you can get them. Um, uh, energetic particle environment, understand the masses, the radii, get those numbers to high precision, search for magnetic fields, all that stuff. We actually proposed to do every last thing on this entire page except for turning a magnetometer to do the magnetic field search. And we wrote a credible proposal and we went off and built it. And uh, this is the spacecraft on the floor of the clean room at the Kennedy Space Center before we 
put it up on top of that monster rocket, which I will talk about in just a minute, I will tell you that I call those four years the blur. Those 232 trips. At first, I was in Maryland so often at Hopkins that my wife started to call Maryland home away from home. By the time we got to 2005, she was calling Boulder my home away from home. And although I was home, I think about 90% of the weekends, I don't remember my oldest kid going to high school. They tell stories, and I don't remember that story. I was just gone. We were doing this, and it took an enormous commitment on everybody's part. But you know what? We didn't get canceled. We didn't go over budget by more than a few percent. Almost unheard of in the space business. And we showed up at the Cape with this little spacecraft, not much bigger than a piano. Nuclear power, everything inside is redundant, like on Noah's Ark. Big dish antenna, you can see it for communicating with the Earth. The hair curl looking black thing is, is um, the, the nuclear power supply. NASA calls it RTG. Stands for uh, Radioisotope Thermoelectric Generator. Say that three times fast. Um, I call it the really terrific generator, because we could not do these missions without it. We are going to a place where the sunlight is a thousand times dimmer than it is here on the Earth. And so solar rays just don't work out there. They don't work first because the sunlight's too weak, and second because it's only 30 degrees above absolute zero that the solar rays crack and break. They do not work. So you have to do nuclear power. And on board this spacecraft, in addition to uh, that nuclear power supply, are all kinds of electronics, main computers. This is a, a, a map of the spacecraft and its systems. And uh, it's, there's no quiz at the end, so you don't have to really read this. Um, we have a redundant telecommunication system on board. We have redundant star trackers, inertial measurement units for guidance, redundant guidance computers, redundant main computers. Uh, almost everything is redundant. Even all the thrusters are redundant. They use for propulsion and for steering. Fuel tank is not redundant. We've only got one of those, but we've got two sets of plumbing coming out of it. Uh, and the scientific instruments are one of a kind. But although many of them back each other up, we have more than one camera, but they're not identical. Um, and green color, by the way, uh, is used in our design reviews. Uh, uh, in white, actually, we use this indicate what's working. And you will see that absolutely everything on there is green, except a couple things are white because we've never had to turn them on even to test them. And there's one little guy that's red over there. It's a single thermistor that failed when we first launched in the propulsion system. And about four days into flight, it started working. We're 2,588 days out. It's been working ever since. And we think it was just warm because it was built to go so far from the sun and it was in there broiling at the Earth's orbit. But really, we have a very healthy spacecraft. And on board are seven scientific instruments. This is the most advanced set of scientific instruments to ever be sent on a first reconnaissance to a new planet, period. And the reason for that is the last time they built a first reconnaissance spacecraft, it was the 1970s. It was very primitive technology compared to the 2000s. Um, let me tell you what these different instruments do so you get a feel for the kind of things we'll do. And I'll start um, with the, some of the less interesting, more technical ones. At the top is one called REX. That's our radio experiment. And we actually are going to beam from the Earth giant antennas 200 feet across called the Deep Space Network. We'll launch radio waves to Pluto to be timed just as my spacecraft is going behind Pluto to pass through Pluto's atmosphere. And REX will measure. Uh, the phase delay, if you're a technical person, or the amount of bending due to atmospheric refraction in the atmosphere. And through that experiment, by doing that second after second after second, as the spacecraft moves behind Pluto, we can actually make a plot of the temperature and pressure profile in the atmosphere and determine the structure of the atmosphere all the way up. Pepsi and SWAP are charged particle instruments that are going to measure ionized gases coming off Pluto's atmosphere. They're our sense of smell, if you will, for composition. Lori, all of the amateur astronomers would love, is basically a C8, a very high-tech C8, with a, a 1024 by 1024 CCD in the back end. It's a long focal length camera, and it allows us to do some really interesting things. One is, because it's long focal length, we can actually beat the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope for 10 weeks on the way in. 
So we can turn this encounter into something much more than a weekend at Pluto. We're going to make it a 20 week, 10 weeks on the way in, 10 weeks on the way out extravaganza. But also with that camera, I can accomplish a couple of other objectives. One thing I haven't told you is that Pluto rotates very slowly on its axis. It takes six and a half days to make one turn, one revolution on its axis. And what that means is, when we fly by Pluto, we'll see one side close up, but the other side, last time we saw it, was 3.2 days ago, half a turn. But with this long focal length camera, I can get good pictures, even on the far side of Pluto. About as good as you would get if you took some garden variety binoculars and looked up at the moon, the full moon. So good enough to see a lot of detail. Nothing like what we'll see on the, the close approach slide. But that's pretty impressive. But the other thing is when we get close, Lori also gives us spy satellite resolution. Well, almost. When we pass over Pluto at the distance that, well, if we were flying over Dallas at the same distance we would fly from Pluto, we could look down at this campus and count the buildings. We could see the shapes of the large ones. Because we'll have about 70 meter resolution. Um, we have the first student built instrument ever to fly on a planetary mission that counts dust impacts. Um, that tell us about the debris in the outer solar system. And then my two favorite named instruments, Ralph and Alice, the honeymooners, they actually were together. At one point, they were in one box. And when they got their divorce, they got their names. Um, Alice is an imaging ultraviolet spectrometer that tells us the composition of the atmosphere and about its escape rate. And Ralph is a kind of all singing, all dancing, costs about as much money as a luxury hotel. It's our thermal mapping instrument, our composition mapping instrument, our main color mapping instrument, our main optical navigation, and our main uh, uh, black and white, what we call panchromatic mapping. It is really the heart of the scientific investigation. And the way that you get to Pluto in nine and a half years is with a very small spacecraft, as small as you can get away with, and then you go out and you buy the biggest rocket that anyone will sell you. And we bought the Atlas V, uh, $180 million launch vehicle, about as tall as a 22-story building. That wasn't enough, not for New Horizons. We went out looking for an upper stage to put on top of this thing. My spacecraft is this is a little green thing at the top. It looks like a hood on it. We basically took the largest launch vehicle in the inventory. We added an extra stage, and then we launched it basically empty. This thing has a payload bay. 60 feet tall. <coughs> and my little spacecraft is about twice the size of this podium. And we put it up on the top, and NASA did one of those typical NASA miracles. They put the decal on with no creases. I could never do that in the <laughs> And then one day, we closed the door, we kissed it goodbye, and we started doing countdowns. I love this picture of New Horizons, and it's actually right after we fueled that nuclear power supply. They fueled it and had to close the door within 15 minutes. They had five minutes to let just a few of us get our picture taken. And I love this picture because I was last. I asked to be last because I knew it would be the last picture ever taken of New Horizons. And that's why it's my favorite. It's the last time we saw this before they shut the door. And then we had our launch readiness review. And you know what? Everybody was go, and we were on budget. And it was during those three weeks, so we were going to get to fly by Jupiter, shave three and a half years off the flight time. We launched on the 19th of January, our <coughs> third attempt, and it was flawless. This downtown this skyscraper-sized rocket was so empty that it lifted off at almost two Gs, broke the sound barrier in 28 seconds, something that an F-18 cannot do going vertical and accelerated, as I said, to this very high speed, past the orbit of the moon, literally film at 11 that night. And off we went across the solar system on this very long journey, which we are now on. We are now seven years into a nine and a half year journey. The first thing we had was a cruise to Jupiter for that gravity assist, the slingshot flyby. We had about a year, actually 13 months. We called that period cruise one, and then the rest of the journey is cruise two, much longer. And during that first year, we had to learn to fly the spacecraft, check out all the systems, check out all the backup systems. We had to get precisely on course for a very narrow window in space that would sling us at Jupiter towards Pluto. 
Because if we didn't hit that little window, we're going somewhere else. And it's sort of game over at that point. Uh, we checked out and calibrated all the scientific instruments and we planned a Jupiter encounter. And we did all that the first year. Jupiter encounter was in early 2007. Three objectives. Hit that aim point, that's above all else. Number two, ring the spacecraft out on a real flyby as the shakedown crews for Pluto eight years later and then get as much science as you could. We did 700 scientific observations. We met all three objectives. The spacecraft performed flawlessly. The instruments performed flawlessly. Um, high radiation caused us to lose a few of the observations because instruments would shut themselves down. It's called safing. When onboard software detects something's not right, it wants to restart, sort of like your computer restarting. But uh, really performed very, very well. No significant problems. And we got on the cover of the Rolling Stone. These are actual pictures taken from New Horizons of Jupiter and its large moon called Io, uh, the pizza planet, the volcano moon. The, the little blue crown above the top is actually the biggest volcano on Io. It's called the Bashtar. And it happened to be erupting 300 miles into space as we did the flyby. And that's actual true color of, of the plume. I'll show you more about that plume in just a sec. And we got great data on all kinds of things. You can see other volcanoes going off on the backside and the night side. It's very easy to see them. Um, we studied Jupiter's atmosphere and its very tenuous little ring. We studied the satellites. Our main job, of course, was to hit that aim point and to do that, that checkout of the spacecraft. But we got a lot of science. One of the things we did that was really unique, that we wanted the most fun, is that we made a movie of Tavashtar going off. And no one has ever made uh, a movie, if you will, of an uh, extraterrestrial volcano before. I'm going to show it to you. Um, don't get your expectations up too high, because there's only five frames in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it was filmed over eight minutes. But I like it, so I'm going to show it to you. Ready? The Bashtar. I like that so much I'll show it to you again. <laughs> 300 miles into space, kilometer per second muzzle velocity. Unbelievable. This is actually real stuff, right? This is not created CGI in your computer. And, and then we left Jupiter and faced a very difficult prospect of eight years to take care of that spacecraft, to be good stewards of that spacecraft. Uh, and a very long journey, essentially two presidential administrations. Um, if you look at that little, little slider chart along the bottom, every time you see yellow is when we wake the spacecraft up, and every time that it's some other color, it's pretty much dosing off in what we call hibernation. That lets us operate the spacecraft much less expensively because our mission ops team can be very small. Tell you a story. I ended up on an airplane completely by accident next to the Voyager project manager one day um, after we launched the Horizons, and I said, "I got a question for you. I'm curious. How many people worked on Voyager when you were flying it?" He goes, "Well, I can't, actually I was the project manager for the extended mission to Uranus and Neptune, and we were down to a skeleton crew of about 150 people. We had 25 people on the Horizons, and and we do everything." We write all the codes and sequences for the flybys. We take care of the spacecraft. We do all the engineering analysis. We do all the science. Um, and while it's sleeping, we can be doing other things, like planning the next year's activities. But the other part of the genius of hibernation is that most of the electronics are turned off most of the time. So when we get, if you count the on hours, by the time we get to Pluto, most of the electronics boxes are only about three years old, even though they're actually nine and a half years old. Think of the analogy, if, if you um, uh, wanted to use your television set in the summer of 2015 and you brought it into your house and plugged it in in January of 06, you had two options. One was leave it on for the next nine and a half years, come back and see if it's working. Or the other is uh, turn it off all the time and once a year wake it up to see if it's still working or whether you have to call for the warranty. Which one do you think would be more likely to make, make it to 2015? That's, you can see what we chose. And it's, it's been a long journey. We are all the way over here in 2013. You can see that we are most of the way. In fact, we're getting a little bit worried because we're used to hibernating. It's been a long time since we've had round the clock operations. And it's not very far off now. But in 2015, we're going to be there. And this is 
is going to be a spectacular encounter. It's going to be a great opportunity for people, not just here, but around the world, to really see what it's like to go to a completely new planet, a new kind of planet, too. Um, the encounter starts in January, and it doesn't end until July. It's a very long encounter. All the best stuff comes in June and July, but there's a long run up to it. I'll tell you a little about that. By the way, um, if you don't know it, I know many of you do, uh, when we planned this mission, all we knew was that Pluto had this giant Texas-sized satellite called Sharon. Just before we launched, we discovered two more satellites, which we named Nix and Hydra. And more recently, we found additional satellites. We now have five satellites in the system, six objects total. So that makes it tougher on us planning the encounter because we want to look at everything. There's just more things to divide our attention on. The encounter phases are called approach phase one, two, and three. Near encounter phase, or NEP, and then the departure phases. So you can see the entirety of 2015, we're involved in the encounter. And we've been planning this in a lot of detail for quite a while. It's sort of our little Normandy invasion. Um, and we are lining up not just the flight plan, but the very detailed sequences, and not just for the nominal encounter, but backup plans. For example, we have a book with 242 contingencies in it, every one of them completely planned out. Some of them, the software is already up on the spacecraft so we can react immediately on board with, um, with software. Um, when we come at the system, I haven't told you a lot about the astronomy of Pluto, but Pluto is actually turned on its side, tipped over like the planet Uranus, and its pole is facing back towards the Earth and the Sun, just by coincidence. So when we come at it, our red trajectory, we're coming from the, over here on the right where the Sun is. We're going that way from right to left. We're coming at it sort of like a bullseye. And that means that when we get closest to Pluto, within minutes, we're closest to all the different moons as well. So that's how you prefer that it be tipped straight up and you can pass the moons one at a time on the way in and the way out. This makes it more challenging, but we're prepared for that. When we get very, very close, this is what it looks like in the early morning hours of Tuesday, the 14th of July when we arrive, Bastille Day, it's easy to remember, we storm the gates of Pluto, Bastille Day 2015, and we will fly through the shadows of Pluto and Sharon, which is a navigational challenge, very narrow windows, because we want to watch the Earth set and rise behind each object so we can do those radio observations. We want to watch the Sun set as well and rise so that the ultraviolet instrument can probe the atmosphere the same way with um, uh, sunlight streaming through Pluto's atmosphere. The, that um, we can watch be extinguished. Um, when, we, when we plan this out, this is sort of the mid-level detail now I'm showing you. Um, this is actually the morning of the encounter. And every one of those little things that looks like a, a little battery cell is an observation. And they're color-coded by instrument. So the, the sort of purplish or bluish one is the ultraviolet, the red one's the infrared, the green is our main mapper. And you can see, uh, there's a lot going on on the spacecraft. The little battery tops, if you notice those above the actual, what looks like the main cell of the battery. The battery top is when we're prepping the spacecraft for the observation. It may be turning to a target. We're setting up the solid state recorder. We're warming up the instrument, or in some cases, cooling down the instrument. We're doing all those things. I just want you to get the impression there's a lot going on. You're going to get your money's worth out of this. Um, this is an example of one high res mapping sequence that, that we will make. Now, I want to stress something uh, before I go on. I'm almost the end of this talk anyway. That what we're doing is really challenging. We are operating a spacecraft essentially on its own. At the speed of light, if something goes wrong, it would take four and a half hours to tell us on the Earth. And if we could do something about it instantly, like flip a switch, four and a half more hours till that signal to flip the switch gets back up the spacecraft. It is nine hours from home. And so it's got to be able to take care of itself. And it's very far away. Let's build a scale model of the solar system. Let's make this Pluto. If this is Pluto, then the Earth is about the size of a beach ball. And the moon is over where that exit sign is behind you. And Pluto's 100 miles away. That's how far we're going. And we're going to pass right off the deck, just about this far from Pluto, on that flyby. This is another imaging sequence that we're doing where we're actually going to make, as we pass by, the same kinds of images at two different angles so that we can use stereo viewers on the computers back on home when the data's back to actually recover the altitudes of all the mountains, the depths of all the craters, 
do all of the geophysics that goes with that, and it's just one kind of observation that we're making. But the data sets that we're going to collect are going to be absolutely spectacular. As I said, we have this really high-tech payload that blows the doors off anything that's ever been on our first reconnaissance mission before. Better cameras, better spectrometers, thermal mapping. Um, uh, we'll view all the satellites. We will view Pluto the same way. We'll study the atmosphere. We'll search for atmospheres around the satellites. We'll map the compositions and temperatures on all six bodies. Um, measure Pluto's escape rate, the escape rate of its atmosphere that's leaking into space. And uh, we'll even learn things about Pluto's interior, like whether or not it has a core. And to give you a feeling, the best image we've ever made of Pluto with the Hubble Space Telescope is over there on the left. It's the bottom of the tube. That's it. We can see that there's bright patches, enormous things that look like a polar cap up north, and some other interesting structures. But that's about all we can tell. Now, this is what a typical planetary flyby map looks like after you go there. This is Triton. Triton is about the same size as Pluto. It's only 10% different. In fact, Triton used to be a planet orbiting the sun. And it was captured into orbit around Neptune, so it's now a moon. It doesn't make it less of a planet. It just happens to have a different address now to orbit Neptune. But it's the same size as Pluto. And that's the Voyager map that Voyager made. And the picture in the upper left is Triton from Hubble. So with Voyager, we went from that fuzzy knowledge to a map like this, really stunning difference. But with New Horizons, we will have the detail in this zoom. In some cases, even better. For example, in terms of composition mapping, I will have a spectrum that tells me the composition at a million different locations on the Pluto surface, and a quarter million on its satellite share. So we'll have very detailed compositional maps and similar kinds of uh, thermal maps. And then after we do this flyby, we're going to keep going. We're going to go and explore these other objects farther out in the Kuiper Belt. During the years 2017 to 2021, we expect to make one or two flybys of ancient Kuiper Belt objects. That's our mission. We're going to the very frontier of the solar system with a high-tech little gadget called New Horizons. It's going to radio the data back to the Earth. It's going to be not just on Science Magazine, but above the fold in every newspaper in every big city around the world. And we're going to spend years analyzing this data. NASA loves to talk about first. This is a mission that's full of firsts. Of course, it's the first mission to Pluto. It's the first mission since 1977 when Voyager launched to go to an unexplored planet. I didn't talk about the astronomy of Pluto very much, but it's a double planet because Sheridan is so large. It's this Texas-sized satellite. So it's the first time we've ever been to a double planet. First time we've been to an ice dwarf, this new class of worlds in the outer solar system. The first mission to go study the Kuiper Belt itself. It's the fastest mission ever launched. It's the first one led by an individual scientist to the outer planets, myself. It's the first to ever carry a student belt instrument. By the way, that instrument's working perfectly seven and a half years in, in flight. And it's the first mission to the planets ever led by the Southwest Research Institute, my home institute based in San Antonio, Texas. Well, you know that stamp? <laughs> we plan to change that. We applied to the post office for a new stamp. This is the concept. They've got us on the list of finalists. They should tell us late next year if we can get rid of that old stamp that says not yet explored and have a new stamp from the post office. It looks something like this to commemorate our flyby. I hope we get it. It's up to a committee of people I don't know. Uh, but I'll tell you, just because we've got a little bit of attitude, we took two of those old stamps, we put them on New Horizons, and we're flying right in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and that little boy from 2001, when he grew up, he's in college, and he might just work for New Horizons. He's a freshman physics major. He made straight A's. So I'm pretty proud of that, his first, uh, first semester out. It's really not 2001. It really is 2013. We really will be there the year after next. We are on the verge of doing this enterprise that some of us have worked on since 1989. It really does. If you think that science doesn't involve human characteristics, i got to tell you, there's a lot of joy in doing science. There's a lot of pride in making discoveries. But there are also things like persistence that really matter in the hearts and minds of scientists and engineers who put these projects together and get knocked down and stand up and knock down and stand up and say, I'm not going to quit. 
So I hope you'll be there in 2015. We will. Bastille Day, 14th of July. Be there with us. We're the only country on earth that can do it. And thank you for inviting me. From the club. Do you have to do that year after year for a while to make that work? Yes. Right. 
beginning, another satellite if we discover it. I did a calculation once. If we had a hundred satellites the size of the fourth and fifth, all between Pluto and Cherry, a ridiculous thing. The odds of hitting any one of them are about one in a thousand. We're not going to hit a satellite. What we're worried about is this. Pluto orbits in the Kuiper Belt, which is just filled with orbiting boulders and mountains and things that hit these satellites and then they eject the spray off into orbit around Pluto. And that stuff's very dangerous to us because we're going so fast. If we ran into something a millimeter across like a rice pellet, it could kill the spacecraft. It would pierce the armor. We have Kevlar on the outside of the spacecraft. That stuff is bulletproof shields made up. It could pierce that and get into the avionics boxes, into the plumbing of the fuel system, get into the main fuel tank. Nothing is very good to hit. We didn't build it that. You know, that, that, to have to survive artillery fire. So we are worried about that. And what we've done is uh, we petitioned NASA to let us plan some backups. They're called safe haven by other trajectory. And we have two of them that are fully sequenced planned backup plans. We can pull right off the shelf days before the encounter, fire the engines and go there. And so that's our plan. We also can turn the main antenna into the direction of flight. The main antenna actually is larger than this little wooden model. It covers about 80% of the spacecraft and acts as a shield, a pretty effective shield. We lose some of the science because I have to fly it in a fixed attitude and I can't keep pointing at this. But if it's a choice of that or certain depth, you want to guess which one I'll pick. <laughs> yeah. And that's called ATR or antenna's ramp. Other questions? Yes? Was, um, was Pluto still a planet during the design phase or, or during launch? And how do you feel, uh, and your team, how do you feel about that, the change in its designation? Oh, he's been out on this. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the organization that got so much press for figuring out a bad definition of planets is made up of astronomers. And no offense to the, you all there calling some amateur astronomers, um, but not really the name of planetary scientists. And it's just a different special. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like two different kinds of attorneys. Uh, suppose that you had a, um, a tax attorney handling your divorce settlement. Well, he's an attorney, all right, but he really doesn't know how to do that kind of work. And astronomers don't really know planetary science. And they created an absolutely unworkable definition for planets. And most planetary scientists I know just laugh it off and they don't buy it. And I go to scientific conferences for a living and hear the moon and the large moons of other planets and small worlds. In fact, you just heard about a discovery of a moon sized planet around another star last week. Smallest planet ever discovered around another star. All these little guys are still planets. They have all the characteristics of planets and we just don't buy. Um, what the IAU wants to use. So we don't consider Pluto the motive because we know it's, it's a planet. And it's not a matter of, of, you know, it's not like a religious matter. It really is true that in, 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 in space field, everything is characterized really by what it is, not where it is. And the definition of a planet that the IAU put together, when you write down the equations that describe this zone clearing, bias against distant planets because the zones get bigger and bigger as you go farther and farther out. You need a bigger and bigger planet to clear the zone. So here's an example of how laughable this model is. If you replace the nine classical planets in our solar system, from Mercury and Pluto with Earth's, if Mercury was exactly the size and composition of the Earth, and Venus was to the Earth and Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, all the way to Pluto, and then apply the IAU definition to it. These are nine identical objects in different locations. The first six qualify as a planet, the last three don't, and they're identical. That's how ludicrous this is. So we don't buy it, we call it a planet, and that's what it is. I like to use the Star Trek as person. You know, we don't need a bunch of PhDs like me to do this. When you watch Star Trek and they turn on the viewfinder, you know in about 500 milliseconds whether they, they're visiting a planet or a comet or an asteroid or a star or a big bad alien spaceship. And you really don't have to go up and compute the stability of a solar system and get back in the morning after those runs to figure it out. It's not so hard. Anybody else? Yeah. Let's see. Uh, right here, show them. Do you uh, see human element for being involved in that kind of thing? 
Sure, hope so. And if you do get saved now, do you have any discussion of time before it happens? It's really hard to make predictions like that. Um, our human space exploration program uh, is pretty sick. It's been sick for about 40 years. The, 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 the secret sauce to breaking out into a really different regime is commercial space flight. You know, in the last few months, you've heard about private space stations. These are real projects. These are not made up. About what we're doing with Golden Spike, which is selling expeditions to the moon for other countries. You, you will hear this coming week about a guy named Heathaw, who made several hundred million dollars after he left the space business and flew himself up the space station and is now launching a private Mars mission. Um, we're really at the beginning of something that is completely game-changing. And it's hard to predict if humans and Pluto and the outer edge of the solar system is 50 years off or 500. But I know what humans are, and we are explorers. And if we don't, if we don't cause ourselves a bad demise, I would expect that um, there will be people all across the solar system. Um, uh, and probably sooner than we think, not later. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, are there uh, other Kuiper Belt objects that are as far above and below the plane of the solar system as Pluto is? There are actually are Kuiper Belt objects that are much further from the plane. Okay. Pluto's orbit is inclined about 17 degrees to that plane, and there are plenty of KBOs that are up at 30 and 50 and some even at 90 degrees. That's also a characteristic, by the way, of being farther from the sun. The same kinds of perturbations that would make a, a minor inclination change at Mercury or Earth makes a much bigger effect farther out because the sun's gravity is weaker and can't move it down to the plane. Yes, right here. What do you have planned beyond Pluto? Do you have the chances of looking at some other objects? So it'll take us about a year to get on the data room because the data rates are slow from that far away. Uh, and then we will do one or if we have enough fuel, two Kuiper Belt object flybys in the succeeding five years. My daughter has a question that she's a little nervous to ask. So I want to ask it for her. And interestingly enough, it's the same question I probably had announced her age. She just wants to know what do you think it's going to look like? Visually, what is it going to look like? Any, any uh, prediction? <laughs> That's a great question. What's her name? What's your name? Lexi. Lexi, that's a great question. Uh, I think I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. Um, right before you were born, when we had the first scientific conference to plan a mission to Pluto, uh, at, the, at the banquet dinner at the end, um, we challenged everybody to write and put in an envelope a scientific prediction for what we would find if we know. And we seal those anomalies. We're going to open them in 2015. And then 1993. It should be a hoop. Because you know, people would tell me, like, I'm betting that the methane mixing ratio of the atmosphere is really twice what the Crochet thinks. You know, very detailed predictions. You know, I'll bet that the planet's core formed in the first 10% of its history. Those kinds of things. Well, a lot of detailed things. Um, and I'm the only guy who's guaranteed to be right. Because in my envelope, in answering the question, what will we find when we get to Pluto, I wrote something wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer to your question. Is we're going to find all kinds of things we didn't know. We have done that every time we've gone to a new planet. You know, when we first went to Mars, nobody expected to find river valleys, but they're all over Mars. Nobody expected volcanoes in the outer solar system. Or a planet like Mercury that's all core and virtually no crust. And we just keep getting surprised by nature. And that's the best part. So I don't really know the answer, but I can't wait to find out what it is. Yes. You mentioned Golden Spike. And, um, <laughs> I, I've been really curious to find out, um, and I didn't want to interrupt the program with Pluto questions, but um, is there an update that you can give us on, on the planets for? Well, we're deep in, in uh, uh, engineering studies right now. We've got North and Brown that built the Lunar Lander. Uh, we've got United Launch Alliance and other companies uh, working on spacesuits and landers and so forth. 
And what they're finding is it's entirely feasible, and entirely feasible to do these breakthrough prices that are only about twice the price of New Horizons. You can put a crew on the moon and bring them back. And what that means is that for space and science agencies around the world, <coughs> used to flying missions like this for the same price, they can stage human exploration missions, which have much higher impact, not just on the public, but scientifically. And so we think there's going to be a real market out there for that. We're hoping to start the procurement process for these vehicles late next year, have them under contract two years from now, and stage the first test missions in 2017. Others? Yes? Uh, could you tell us more about the org cloud? Is that what you're referring to? So Jan Ork figured out um, this structure is very far from the sun. It's a thousand times farther than Pluto. So it's 30,000 times as far away as the Earth is from the sun. Um, let, me, let me make a scale model. Let me tell you about a scale model of the solar system to show you how far away this is. Up in Maine, along the highway, they have a scale model of the solar system. It's one mile from the Earth to the sun. And so Pluto is 40 miles down the road. And I, I once went out there to give a talk, and they asked me where the work cloud was on this model. And the answer is in Antarctica. <laughs> the work cloud is the result of the final stages of the accretion of the giant planets. They have enormous gravities. And accretion is the process by which things hit them and, and fall into their atmospheres and therefore help the planets grow. They get pelted and pelted and pelted and just keep growing. But a lot of things miss and they get the new horizons effect, the gravity assist, and slung out. They get slung out of these long orbits that are called poor cloud orbits. And so the detritus of planetary formation is in your cloud. Everything from boulders to mountains to small planets, probably the Earth sized world. And um, we know very little about it. We know that it's there because we see comets all coming from the same location very far away. Um, and some of the newer technology telescopes will let us find the planets in that region. They're just now coming online the next few years. So when you're talking about uh, other objects beyond Pluto, mm -hmm. are you talking about the Borg cloud or something in between? Well, uh, all the things that I talked about in this talk that are in the Kuiper Belt are like Pluto's distance, or maybe twice as far. Nothing like the Borg. Make sense? Anybody else? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I've always wanted to know the team of people that are back at home monitoring this, whether it's Voyager or New Horizons or any of the others, like what does that mean on a daily basis? Does somebody get up in the morning and go check the Voyager data to see what new stuff has come in? Or how does that work operationally? So, okay, here's, here's the 101. Okay. Um, the spacecraft communicate with the Earth by radio. And when they're very far away, like New Horizons and the two Voyagers, they're the only three spacecraft really far away. Um, the data rates are pretty low, it's a lot slower than you would put up with the reading email. A few thousand bits per second. For Voyager, a few dozen bits per second. Okay? And the data comes down to giant, enormous dish antennas called the Deep Space Network. And NASA has three installations around the world. One's in California, one's a third of the way around the world, in Spain, one direction, and another third of the way around the world in um, Australia. So every third of the way around, so that basically you can always put an antenna on any part of the sky, at least one of those antennas. The data comes down there, and over secure internet lines, it goes to wherever the mission control is. And then people sit in front of computers and, and see that data. And in our case, uh, we hibernate the spacecraft, I talked about that uh, quite a bit. And when we designed hibernation, we didn't want to just fire and forget, see how it's doing once a year. So we set up something called beacon crews, where the spacecraft has a very intelligent processor on board that's literally checking thousands of parameters all the time, every few seconds. And any time uh, something goes wrong, it notes that. If it, if it requires immediate action, the spacecraft will actually take that action. But it's just sort of a computer reset uh, or relatively minor stuff, temperatures off. It puts that in a report, and we get those reports once a month. They're a bunch of engineering numbers for different parameters. 
But also in addition, once a week, every Monday, the spacecraft sends what's called the beacon tone. And uh, the beacon tone can be green or any of seven shades of red to get brighter and brighter red. And so far we've only had two of the lowest reds in the entire seven and a half years uh, out there. And if you follow us on Twitter, if you look up New Horizons and follow it on Twitter, most Mondays you'll see a key green beacon, which some people misread and think it says green bacon. <laughs> <laughs> but green beacon uh, means we had a good week. Okay, I can't do this as long as you want. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, um, the uh, the uh, original uh, Pioneer uh, spacecraft, uh, they noticed you know a uh, small anomaly in the orbit that they tried to figure out anything from dark matter to the uh, the uh, nuclear reactor causing uh, thermal emissions that might cause that. Have you noticed anything like that in New Horizons, or uh, do you plan to look for that? Um, we do see the same thing in both cases. They're they're just an effect of the spacecraft's design. They're caused by the infrared photons coming off that hair curl looking nuclear generator and thrusting on the spacecraft with light pressure, radiation pressure. That's all that is. Anybody else? Way in the back. Um, you, you mentioned um, two possible hyperfeld object encounters. So there are so these are known already discovered objects? No, we're looking. Okay, so here's the thing. We know from the surveys that are already out there that there are something like 100,000 objects out there that we could fly by. And uh, we have to look very hard against right along when our trajectory goes. Actually, we don't look exactly where our trajectory goes. It's like skeet shooting. We have to look ahead at ones that would be along our trajectory when we get there in the late 2010. And we're doing those searches with enormous ground-based telescopes, like the CAT. So far, we have found about 30 candidate KVOs, but none of them go close enough to our trajectory to be within our fuel supply. They're getting close, but we can do what are called Monte Carlo simulations in the computer. Um, how many we have to find in order to find one that we can reach? And the answer is we have to find about 100 <coughs> in order to get one that will come within our the cone that we can reach with fuel. So far we found 30, 35 of them. And over the next couple of years with more observing on this, we will find the rest because now we've got it down pat. We just have to keep looking. And we expect to ultimately find enough for a couple of flight lines. Yeah. Can you tell if there is sound out there? Um, we can't tell uh, because the vacuum of space is empty. It doesn't transmit sound. It's like a insulator. So if Pluto's making noises, it won't get to my spacecraft. And since it won't get to my spacecraft, we didn't put a microphone on court did. We don't tell us anything except what the spacecraft sounds like. So anybody else? Okay. Well thanks for inviting me.